just welcome today to this presentation of the Friends of the Page Walker. This is our historic Houses on the Move series for the summertime. And we're just delighted to showcase three historic homes in Cary that have been recently moved. And we want to share their stories with you so that you'll understand the history and, um, and be able to appreciate uh, the people who are associated with the homes. And we thank Pat Musa and Jay Keir, uh, the Cary Regional Library, for actually sponsoring our, our three lectures or presentations. Now, I usually start presentations that I give with this caveat. I say that I am not a professional genealogist or a trained researcher, but what I lack in professional accolades, I try to make up in enthusiasm. And so I'm very enthusiastic about uh, the history of the Nancy Jones House. So let's go ahead and get started. I want to talk about the origins of the land. The, the Jones family goes back a long way in time in our area, even before Wake County became Wake County. At one point, would you believe that we are sitting on land that was Craven County? So it starts down in Newburn, but this was also Craven County in the early, late 1600s, early 1700s. Then, in 1746, Johnston County was carved out of Craven County. So we're also sitting on land that was Johnston County. And then, in 1771, Wake County was formed. So. You, when you do historical research, you do really have to be aware of when counties were formed and where the lines were so that you don't spin your wheels a whole lot in trying to find records that are in some other county that you didn't even know about, especially the ones that don't exist anymore, like Dobbs County. So uh, there really was nothing in this area until the mid-1700s. It was forest land. It was a hunting ground for the Tuscarora Indians, and uh, they had, you know, they were going through the land until white settlers arrived. And this is Lord Granville and the first deed that we know of in this area. The earliest known landowner in our area was Francis Jones, and if you can read handwriting, you can see. Uh, it says, number two, I believe, Francis Jones, 640 acres. He was a resident of Edgecombe County, and he received a land grant from Lord Carteret, who later became Earl Granville, and thus the name of the Granville Grant is in our area. He, this was in 1749, and he got that 640 acres of land, which is uh, equivalent to one square mile. And it was in Johnston County. I don't know if you can read it, but on the second line it says, of land in Johnston County. And then it began at the blackjack tree. <laughs> Where would the blackjack tree be? You know, that's one of those um, ways that they used to draw up deeds. So, we have that in 1749. And here is part of a map that is composed of early land grants in Wake County. Uh, formerly Johnston County. Uh, this was drawn up and researched by a man named A.B. Markham in Durham, and he went to the archives and pulled land grants before the internet was available, and all of it's online now. And he tried to piece together the different deeds around this area. So you can see that I've labeled the Joel Lane 1779 grant uh, as approximately Cary. And then the Francis Jones land is to the left and up a little bit. That's a 1749. That shows you the relative position between the town of Cary now and the Nancy Jones house. Now, there's really no proof at all that Francis Jones ever lived in this area. Um, his will was probated in Edgecombe County, which means that he was a resident there. So he just probably had a lot of money wanted to invest in land, his land was available, and he bought it. When he passed away, though, he willed his land to two of his sons. One of them was named Nathaniel. That was Nathaniel, who would later become Nathaniel Jones Sr. And then another son named Tignall, or Tignall Jones, who 
as you can see here, you could probably see his name. You can see Tignall Jones and um, Nathaniel Jones and Francis Jones, all those Joneses with mm -hmm. land kind of around the original Francis Jones ground. Now another view of this land is, this is uh, drawn by Jerry Miller and it was in his first edition of Around and About Carry. It was a really small volume, but it had this lovely fold out map that shows the main roads in the area and the railroads. And I'm, I labeled the one house that's right smack dab in the middle there as Bradford's Ordinary and then the Page Homestead. And then you can see along the railroad and the stage road, number four, with the square around it, that was the Jones property in that area. Now that we have kind of an idea about the land, let's talk about the Nathaniels, because that's where the fun comes in. And people who know Carrie history and all the different Nathaniels are giggling about this because it gets so terribly confusing. So this is the family tree. They're complicated. The Joneses are complicated, some are related, and some are not. And they share a lot of the same names, which makes it even more fun. Now, Nathaniel Jones was his son. Nathaniel Jones Sr. was the son of Francis. And he left his land to children in his will after the death of his wife, Anna. Anna the Snickers or Snickers, depending on which spelling is used at the time. He left land to his son, Nathaniel Jones, Jr., or Nathaniel Jones of Crabtree, and then he left some land to his son, Henry Jones of Crabtree. So let's talk about Nathaniel Jones, Jr., just to kind of deal with him and get him out of the way. Nathaniel Jones, Jr., uh, or Nathaniel Jones of Crabtree, received land on Crabtree Creek in Raleigh. Now, you might not be aware that Crabtree Creek runs a long way through Wake County. Part of it's over on our side of town, of the county, and part of it, it goes all the way through Raleigh. Um, it crosses, Wake Forest Road crosses it, and it keeps on going. So the damages of Crabtree had land on that Raleigh side of Wake County. And this was his house. It was a very impressive house that stands near the Beltline and Wake Forest Road. You cannot see it on either the Beltline or the Wake Forest Road, but it's tucked back in there and it's been restored. It's a beautiful home, historic. But that's all we're going to say about Nathaniel Jones Jr. today, or Nathaniel Jones of Crabtree. We're going to uh, turn our attention to Nathaniel Jones Sr. giving land to his son, Henry Jones. And he gave Henry my old tract of land on Crabtree where he lives together with all the other land taken up by me or bought by me joining the old tract on the waters of Crabtree Creek also the land whereon I now live to him so he was giving Henry a huge amount of land on this side of the county and what we think is that this was his technique of establishing his sons on the land that they were going to inherit but he wasn't going to give it officially to them until he was passed away that kept kids on the land and kept them from moving west young man you know it was that go west young man find more land out west but that was I, we think that was his way of keeping them close at home so you know it, it was pretty successful they, they, they stayed around here so this brings us to the Nancy Jones house. We have really, we extensively researched the house. We've referred to the National Register documentation, deeds and wills, and it still really isn't exactly clear. There's not a date etched in a brick or anything like that of this house that tells us when the house was actually finished. But um, some people say 1803 up to 1825, but most people say it was about 1803. And we're not really sure exactly who built the house. Uh, you would think that it was Henry, you know, the son Henry who built the house, but regardless of who built the house, um, it was the house of Henry and his wives. And I say wives, um, because we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the house was built along a stagecoach road that ran from Raleigh to Hillsborough. 
and it would have been one of the grander houses along the way. It was painted bright white, so it would have stood out. It would have been an imposing house on the stage road. And um, it was located about 10 miles from Raleigh, carries about 8 miles from the center of Raleigh. That was always the, the way that in the old, in earlier days that Carrie was referred to always as 8 miles from Raleigh. And so a couple more miles down the road was the Nancy Jones house. And it would have been a convenient stop for travelers in their stagecoach on the way from Raleigh to Hillsborough. It would have been a, a way for them to get out, stretch their legs, have some liquid refreshment, have a bite to eat, and then continue on their journey to Hillsboro or, Ch or Chapel Hill. Now there's really no indication that it was ever like an inn that they would have stayed at overnight, just a way to stop and get refreshment and then be on their way. Now we don't have any really firm evidence as to when it became a stagecoach stop. Um, we do know that people uh, around here have heard of Bradford's Ordinary, right? That was uh, on one of the maps I, I, I showed you, the Jerry Miller map. And Bradford's Ordinary started in the late 1700s, but by about 1810, John Bradford, who ran Bradford's Ordinary, really just disappears from the scene. I have been through all the court minutes of Wake County through about 1820, and you see him drop out about 1810, and he never reappears. And so we don't know what happened to him, but his disappearance at Bradford's Ordinary here in Cary would have opened up an opportunity for just a couple miles down the road for the Jones family to offer their house as a stagecoach stop. That's kind of, I mean, that makes logical sense. We don't have any proof, but it makes a good story, too. <laughs> so, let's take a peek inside the house. Uh, this is what the house looks like today. No, it, it, not what it looks like today. Do you notice the air conditioner? <laughs> that was not original to the, the house. But this is an older picture on its original site. But this is the interior of the house. This, this photograph of the, uh, on the left was from a newspaper article in the News and Observer around the year 2000. And I'll talk more about that newspaper article. But you can see the lovely detail on the mantle in the center. And then it's got some robust newel posts. And you can see that the walls are made out of shiplap. Chip and Joanna Gaines don't have anything on us here <laughs> in Wake County, okay? So we know how to do shiplap too, not just in Texas. One thing that I discovered in researching the house was this amazing piece of furniture. Now this was, this is a piece of furniture that is owned by Tryon Palace. And it was auctioned by a Jones family member around 2010. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's a walnut, china, it's called a china press, walnut china press, and it has yellow pine as secondary wood, which is what you would want to see in a piece of, of furniture from that era. And it also, um, they think it originates from eastern North Carolina, which would fit with the Jones family being able to, you know, pr uh, purchase it and then bring it to their house. Um, it was, it has original glass, it has these amazingly robust, scalloped shelves. It was painted blue on the interior and they sent, Tryon Palace sent the piece to Williamsburg and had the paint analyzed and it's got like six layers of paint. You know, they just get paint and paint and paint that thing. But can you imagine it filled with china being in that house and then having it as a stagecoach stop and people coming in and just being so incredibly impressed with this piece of furniture. Now, I really do thank Tryon Palace and their curator for supplying me with all the information. To be honest, I could do an entire presentation on this piece of furniture with all the research they did, but we don't have time for that. So, um, you know, you just think if this piece of furniture could talk, what would it tell us about presidents and governors and dignitaries and just regular people on the stagecoach that stopped in uh, to the Nancy Jones house. So now that we know a little bit about the Jones land and the Jones house and its furniture, let's look at the people. People are always fun. So we're going to look at another family tree and we're going to see that Henry Jones 
was married twice. Now, that's not mentioned in a lot of information that you find about the Jones family, but we found that out. Uh, she, he was married first to Sally McCullers Smith, and then second to Nancy Ann Jones. And so let's look, at, and then I listed the names of the children. He and Sally had one daughter, uh, Eliza Henry Jones, as she referred to herself. And then the second marriage was Algernon Sidney Jones, Amelia Ann, who married a Whitaker, Nathaniel Jones, yes, there was another Nathaniel Jones, Rufus Henry Jones, and Adolphus G. Jones. And I think the G stood for George. This is interesting. Barb Wetmore here on the front, she's my partner in research crime. She and I went over to um, the uh, Rubenstein Library at Duke University uh, last fall to look at their collection of letters of the Rufus Jones family and there was a little journal and we opened it up and it was like, oh my goodness, there's family Bible information in this little journal. So of course we, we copied everything, we scanned, had everything scanned. But you'll see the little cord that looks like it's wrapping the Bible. We had it on like a V-shaped uh, platform, and that little weighted rope was used to kind of hold the pages open. So that's what all that is, just to explain that. But this tells the very sad story of the first marriage. It shows that Henry Jones was the son of Nathaniel Jones, who was deaf, which I thought was interesting for them to, to point mm -hmm. out. He was born in 1766. It does not list the, the date of birth for Sally McCullough Smith. Uh, it lists Nancy Jones' date of birth is 1783. And then it shows that Henry Jones and Sally McCullough Smith were married in September of 1806, and that Eliza Jones followed in 1807. But then, before Eliza was even a year old, her mother died, and she died in 1808. You know, that's just, you know, a lot of a, a lot of grief in in that those pages of the family Bible. So Henry was a widower; he had a baby, and you know, I'm sure that life was a little bit hard for him. But here's a picture of his daughter, Eliza. Um, this was, I found it on Ancestry.com, it's a lovely portrait of her, uh, probably after she got married, and we'll talk about her marriage. But then, this is where Nancy Jones comes on the scene. In this page of the fi Family Bible, we see that Henry Jones and Nancy Jones were married, it, you can't read it, but I do have a copy of the original marriage bond, it's 1813. So at that point, Henry uh, let's see, Nancy Jones was 30 when she got married, so she was no spring chicken. And Henry was married at 40 in his first marriage, so he's 45 now. So, you know, they're a little bit of an older couple, but they end up with these five children. So they're listed here. It looks like Sidney Jones was listed, and then they didn't get his whole name in there, so they scratched that out and then put Algernon. They have to, have to include the Algernon part of it, right? Uh, Algernon Sidney, and then they list all of them. Um, and you can see their birth order. And it looks like it was done at the time of the births because the, the handwriting changes between each entry for the child. So this is uh, the whole family we've seen. Eliza ended up getting married to a man named Dr. John Young. Uh, he was a physician and they moved to Tennessee. They were one of the ones who did go west. So they ended up in Tennessee and then later in Alabama and that's where a big enclave of Jones descendants are down in Alabama. Um, we don't really have letters or information about the years that the children were growing up. But in later letters, in their writing back and forth to each other, it is obvious that they all really cared for each other. You know, it wasn't like, you know, the wicked stepmother and that kind of thing. It was like they really had an affection for each other, and that came out very clearly in the letters. So now that we've been talking about these letters, <laughs> We, there were two sets of letters that we've had, and one is from the people in Alabama gave digital versions to the town of Cary that have been transcribed, and 
and they're just a lot of fun to read through. And then there was this collection of letters at the Rubenstein Museum. So, you know, we've got copies, we've got people who are working on transcribing those documents so that they'll be more accessible because they're really kind of hard to read. And so we want to um, feature the, the best bits in future presentations and blog posts, but I'm going to give you some sneak peeks of what some of those letters have to say. So we're going to start out with the peach brandy. You know, we've been talking about the cider house and all the, you know, the beer places around town, but let's start with peach brandy around here. In 1836, on Christmas Day, Henry Jones wrote to his daughter, Eliza, and she was already married and living in Tennessee, and she apparently had requested his recipe for peach brandy. <laughs> so, this is what he said. Now, this is his recipe. You wish to know my method of making peach wine. In the first place, beat and press the peaches as late in the evening as possible in order to keep the liquor as little chance to ferment as possible. I think he's referring to the peach juice. So, you don't want that to ferment, which it will do in warm weather. And the next morning, have a good, clean, tight barrel ready with about eight gallons of brandy in it. <laughs> and then, um, then you put in the peach juice. And then the letter goes on with lots of explanations about how you drain the dregs and all of that. But anyway, he said he never added sugar, but if you did, he was satisfied it would be best with one pound to ten gallons of brandy. Oh, so who's going to go out and buy eight gallons of brandy and try this recipe? <laughs> there might be a future in that, you know? You never can tell. So anyway, that's the peach brandy that we found out about in, um, you know, in these letters. Now, the Henry Jones family was prominent and they were wealthy. He had a lot of land and he was wealthy enough to send his sons to the university. And this was the Old East Building uh, on the campus of UNC. The letters say one of the brothers, Algernon, wrote to Eliza in Tennessee, all of our brothers are doing well at college. Adolphus will graduate with a distinction, probably the first if he does as well as he's been doing since he has been there. So there was, there was all this communication about the university and what they were studying and the, the kind of the fraternities and the literary societies that they were in. There's so much information about that. Uh, but then the letters also outlined the death of Henry and Nancy's son, Nathaniel. Remember there was Nathaniel Sr. who had Nathaniel Jr. Crabtree and Henry, and then Henry had a son named Nathaniel. And then we can go on from there. There's other Nathaniels. Here's some obituaries that I found. This one, the first one on the left, says, in this county on Tuesday, the 31st ultimate, that's, you know, this was meaning that Nathaniel Jones, age 18, son of Henry Jones, Esquire of Crabtree, died on August 31st, 1841. But only a couple of months later, the father, Henry, died. And this is at Crabtree in this county on the 11th of the present month, Mr. Henry Jones in the 77th year of his age. Affectionate, amiable in all his social relations. Um, that shows a very dark time for the family. And then in a letter that Amelia wrote to Eliza in September of 1841, she, she some of these letters really describe the days surrounding the death and what was going on. It was very interesting. Um, but she said, our brother is buried in the back part of the garden, a little to the left of the head of the middle walk, so that the grave is not seen as you approach it by that walk until you're within a few feet of it. So Nathaniel and Henry were buried at the Nancy Jones house in the back garden. <coughs> And that was not unusual in this area on, on um, plantations, on large farm holdings. Um, there wasn't a town, there wasn't a town. Cary didn't exist, Morrisville didn't exist. So people buried you know, their family in the family graveyard on their property. So that's what happened here. 
So we'll talk a little bit more about the burials and kind of bring them full circle in a minute. The house is also known for a lot of people who pass through it, who stop by for a rest and a little bit of refreshment. And this is a slide of two governors, Governor Dudley on the left of North Carolina and Governor Butler, Pierce Butler of South Carolina on the right. And this is one of the most celebrated stories about the Nancy Jones house. Now maybe they were imbibing some of that peach brandy that Henry Jones had in his cellar. But anyway, here's another set of images that I found in a journal online about this, this interaction between the two governors. They stopped, they were both in the house at the same time, and they tossed down their first round of brandy, whatever they were drinking, but the refill was a really long time in coming. And so one of them, one of the governors said to the other, well, it's a damn long time between drinks. <laughs> now you have to realize in the South that the word damn is two syllables, is damn. <laughs> okay. just, to, just to clarify that point. So um, there have been so many newspaper articles, so many journal articles that have been written about this episode. They don't all agree on who the two governors were. Uh, they don't agree on very much, but Joel Whitaker, remember the name Whitaker. Amelia married a Whitaker and had a son named Joel. And Joel, in his later years, said his grandmother Nancy told him the anecdote about the two governors. Mm -hmm. Who knows what the real truth is? It's just a really good story. <laughs> Some lore does indicate that Nancy Jones wasn't as offended by the use of the bad word as she was as to the slam on her hospitality. Okay, too long between the drinks. That was that was on her reputation. So uh, we think that's what really uh, set her off. Now another important visitor to the house was President James Knox Polk. Now he was born in Mecklenburg County. He was born in 1795. He graduated with honors in 1818 from the university, the University of North Carolina, and as the 11th president of the United States, he was asked to deliver the commencement address at UNC. And so he came down to Raleigh, and he and his entourage, just coaches and coaches and coaches, <laughs> left Raleigh, came as far as Nancy Jones's house, and stopped, and had something to drink, we assume that it was peach brandy. Um, we don't know that for sure, though, but this is his actual journal entry. He made a note of that in his diary and said, at 9 o'clock this morning, I set out with my family and sweet, his entourage for Chapel Hill. We stopped half an hour at Mrs. Jones's 10 miles on the way. Remember, we've established that 10 miles was the Nancy Jones house. And it goes on to say that they stopped in a little place in Chatham County called Mooringsville, uh, which is just across the Wake County line with the family of Moorings there. And so he stopped at Mooringsville, and then at about 6 o'clock, he got to Chapel Hill. I guess, you know, and we complain about I-40. <laughs> you know, that, that's got to have been a rough trip. But anyway, he spoke at the commencement, and um, you know, it's commemorated, so that's a good thing. Now we're coming to the time in our history here where the North Carolina Railroad is being planned and built. Now this, you know, these, these slides are not very easy to see. This is a, a map of the North Carolina Railroad. They, they had maps produced all the way across North Carolina showing the right-of-ways that were being bought up in order to lay the track along the railroad. And this one, since it came through our area, it shows, if you can, if you can tell, it says Mrs. H. Jones, and that would be Mrs. Henry Jones or Nancy Jones. And I put this little inset, you can see that they even drew the little houses and the, the house and the little outbuildings around the house. And it's where it should be. You can see the stage road, you can see the big wide swath is the railroad right of way. And so you can see that the railroad came right through her backyard. 
Now, on another letter, we have we have a kerfuffle that happened. Mm -hmm. um, Rufus is Nancy's son, and she was, he was kind of telling one on his mother. He was writing to Dr. John Young, his brother-in-law, uh, in 1857. This was right after the railroad, you know, had been had been laid through there, and he said, "I was to see Mom today." I think that meant he went to see mom today. She enjoys unexampled health for one of her age. Occasionally, her feelings are upset by having an old cow that has paid for herself a time or two in butter run over by the cars and killed. Oh. But I have no doubt that is the case with all the old woman women along the railroad who <coughs> seldom migrate past their own fences they imagine, because they do not hear about it, that the cars never kill the old cows or pigs of no one else but themselves. <laughs> so, anyway, we had, we had a tragic accident in back of the Nancy Jones house. But when the Nancy Jones house was being inspected, um, after its move to the present location, there was a short section of railroad track that was found shoring up one of the chimneys. And when they went to analyze it, they were thinking that it's probably the original track that was laid. Now, I wonder if that cow met her maker right on that piece of paper. <laughs> Maybe that's how they memorialized the cow. <laughs> anyway, so we're up to the 1850s, and we'll move on to the 1860s. And we have General Sherman on the march up to Bennett Place. So the next event, a big event in our area, was the Civil War. North Carolina, in this area, we were spared a lot until the end, near the end of the war. But by this time, um, the house and the surrounding area had grown up a lot, and it was called Jones or Jones Station. And I found a map from that period of time, made before the Civil War. And you can see Jones is listed. There's still no carry. But there's Jones and Morrisville on the map. You know, it was a going a little settlement there around the Nancy Jones house. So by the end of the Civil War, 1865, General Sherman's troops were on the march through North Carolina, and they were heading to Bennett Place, where Sherman was going to preside over the largest surrender of Confederate troops uh, for the war. And so when regiments would have to report, um, we, could, we could find those, and I did find a couple of uh, reports. This one, you can see the little arrows, it said on April 25th, this is 1865, moved again to near Jones Station and remained there. You know, it says halted at Jones Station, moved again to near Jones Station, and then another regiment, April 25th below, marched 13 miles and camped on the Jones's plantation. They were overrun by Confederate, uh, by Union soldiers. The Joneses were one of many families in the area that had enslaved people on their land. One of the enslaved women on the Jones property gave this account in her slave narrative that the Works Progress Administration, or the WPA, collected in the 1930s. During the war, we have to remember that Nancy's son Rufus and his wife Sarah, or Sally, lived on lived with Nancy. So they were at the, the Nancy Jones house. And so this enslaved woman, Mary Hicks, said, when the Yankees came, Miss Sally, Master Rufus's wife, cried and ordered those scalawags out of the house. But they just laughed at her and took all we got. They even took the stand of lard that we had buried in the old field and the hams hanging up in the trees in the pasture. After they were gone, we found a sick Yankee in the barn. And Miss Sally nursed him. Way after the war, Miss Sally got a letter and a gold ring from that man. Isn't that interesting? So, a little bit about the Civil War. But now we're seeing uh, a recently discovered picture in one of these collections of Miss Nancy Jones later in life. Uh, you can see that she's thinner. Uh, she still has the same kind of bonnet and, and dress on, so her style didn't change. You know, some of us stay kind of have our own style, you know. <laughs> she stuck with hers too. 
in 1874, Adolphus, her youngest son, wrote to Eliza again, Mother will be 91 years old in a few days. She retains the faculties of her mind pretty well, but her physical powers are gradually giving way. She walks about the yard and garden. Sometimes she walks over to a nearby neighbor's house. So that's pretty that's in the You know, the houses are not that close together over there or, or were. But finally, the inevitable happened, and an era came to an end with the death of Nancy Jones in 1876. And, you know, you can see her headstone there. There's Henry Jones, and then below it is Nancy Jones um, in Hillcrest Cemetery. So after Nancy Jones' death, the house and the property passed on to her son Adolphus, and he was the youngest. Now, he said to have run a school out of the house for a while, uh, and that was at about the time that the Cary High School was uh, starting up and being established. Rufus and Sarah had already moved to Cary, and Sarah's brother, uh, Professor Merritt, was the principal of the school, so it's all kind of a really little close-knit, tight-knit community we had going there at the time. Now here we have Hillcrest Cemetery, and maybe that's a little more readable picture. I just took this the other day. Trying to get all of the Jones family um, grave markers in the picture. But in 1878, Rufus wrote to Eliza and let her know about the plans for the home place, that it was being sold. Um, Adolphus was selling it off. So what were they going to do? The family was buried on the property, remember? So uh, Rufus said, I ought to have mentioned that Ma died the 3rd of March, 1876. Of course, they, she already knew that. And just here, while I think of it, sister, I wish to make a request of you, which is this, that you furnish me, if in your power, with the date and the year of Pa and Brother Nat's death. We have removed their remains to the cemetery in the little village of Cary and wish to mark their graves with suitable slabs. I suppose you have perhaps some old letters conveying you to you the intelligence of their deaths. So Henry and Nathaniel's graves, along with the graves of some of the children that died in infancy, were moved at that time and it formed the nucleus of Hillcrest Cemetery. Uh, Rufus and Sally owned some of the land in that area and they set aside an acre for Hillcrest Cemetery at that time. So Adolphus sold the house to a man named S.R. Horn and he moved to Cary too. Several families owned the property after that in the late 1800s and early 1900s. We really don't have a lot of records or anecdotes to tell about that so we're going to fast forward to, and I'm going to refer to the newspaper article uh, that I referred to that was in the News and Observer in 2000. And it had a whole bunch of interesting anecdotes about the house in there. I mean, that's kind of like a, almost like an oral history kind of thing. Now, Russell Heater is a familiar name to a lot of you in the area. Uh, Russell Heater father came down from West Virginia and had a, had a well drilling business in the area for years and years. And Russell Peter was a big cheerleader for Cary. And he had four children. And his son Bob was an infant when the family moved into the Nancy Jones house. And so we have hobos at this point. We're in the 1930s and his older sister Margaret told stories in this article about the hobos from the railroad who would jump off the cars and come to ask for food at the house. There, were, there would be hobos along, traveling along the road in front of the house. So, she, so Mrs. Heater got hit from both sides of the house with the hobos. She always had cornbread baking and she would always offer them cornbread to eat. And Margaret also told about a sturdy peach limb that was at the backyard, back door in case they had to pick it up and, and, you know, fend off the trouble. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there must have been peach trees on that property for a long time. I don't recall seeing any ever, but apparently there were peach trees for a long time. Way past the peach brandy era. <laughs> so, now, the Depression hit the Heater family just like it hit so many families in the area. And Bob remembers with regret 
the family um, had to sell the big crystal chandeliers in the living room and the dining room of the Nancy Jones house because they were bankrupt. The, their business went bankrupt. Um, that's so sad to think that the original chandeliers are not in the house. Uh, but another anecdote, and I don't have a slide for this, people, was that men would drive up to the house seeking services. In other words, um, they thought prostitutes lived there. So I, I was refusing the slide on that. Um, Mr. Heater would disabuse them of that notion, and Mrs. Heater would slam the door in their faces. Um, now, Margaret, the older daughter, never doubted for one minute that the house wasn't haunted. She was absolutely sure that it was. She said that she would hear footsteps at night. She'd call for her daddy. He would come up. He never could find anything, no evidence, no nothing. But she was sure that there were, that there were funny things going on in the house. One final anecdote from this era. Okay. Once, when Margaret's father, Russell, Margaret and Bob's father, Russell, was away, the family heard what they called an ungodly sound in the night. Now, their Aunt Opal was actually living with them at the time, and apparently, in Bob's words, was not afraid of the devil, and she got a flashlight and a gun and went down to the cellar. And she saw this red stuff oozing out of the wall. Okay, so she picked up something, he didn't say what it was, and whacked on the wall. The dirt fell down, and behind it was a wine cellar filled with bottles of wine that had exploded. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering, was it peach brown? Oh, no. <laughs> you know, you just never know. Eight gallons will go on. <laughs> so Bob Peters said that in the end, his mother refused to stay at the house because she couldn't keep the doors locked. She would lock the doors and then the doors would, un she would find them unlocked, okay? So, was that ghosts or what? We, we don't know, but it's what Bob said. So his daddy bought the red brick bungalow, which is right down the street on the corner of Dry and Harrison Avenue, and that's where they lived in Cary for years and years and years. So that's all I got about the Bob Peter era. But those are some pretty good stories. Yeah. In, in 1935, Thomas and Audrey Stone bought the property. And here's a picture of Mrs. Stone and a picture of the house about 1939. It was on a postcard. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And if you notice, in the middle of the roof, there's a windmill. Now, that windmill was blown down during the 1940s, early in World War II, and the scrap metal was used for the war effort. So we don't have the, the windmill anymore. And Mrs. Stone lived in the house until 1991 when she died. She lived there a really long time. And that, after that, there was a succession of families that lived in the house. And a lot of them reported unusual creaks and noises and sounds. And they said it wasn't like any property that they had ever lived in before. So who knows? But in the late 1990s, a gentleman named Kent Kenley rented the house, became its caretaker, refinished the, he said, two-inch plank floors. That's, that's some pretty significant flooring. And painted the interior. And he thought the noises were not unusual at all. So make of that what you will. Now, moving forward a number of years, the large property, including the house and the acreage, was purchased by the Sri Venice Katswara Temple. Now, the temple sold the house to the town of Cary in 2019 with a proviso that the house would be removed from the property. So here we have the Nancy Jones house up on wheels. Now, the Friends of the Page Walker are grateful to the town of Cary for purchasing the house and for saving it for, you know, it just moved really only about 500 feet east of the original site. This was in March of 2021, wasn't it? Yeah. My expert up here on the front row is nodding. Um, the National Register designation had been lost when the house was moved, but once it got moved and was settled in its new location, it retained its kind of 
not original, but a very similar orientation to the stage road on an adjacent piece of property, so the National Historic designation was restored to the Nancy Jones House. So that was a win. Um, so we're, we're glad about that. Now in early 1922, Cary's Historic Preservation Commission initiated the process to landmark or recommend <coughs> Nancy Jones House be designated as a local historic landmark. And this process is, well, it's pretty involved. It, it, two commission members went to visit the house. They assessed the house for historic integrity. They reported that to the Historic Preservation Commission. And following that assessment, a consultant was hired to complete the nomination report. And then in August of 22, almost a year ago, the nomination report was forwarded to SHPO for their comment, which is the State Historic Preservation Office. Thank you. So this is the house today. I was over there on the sidewalk in front of the house. I purposely did not do the orange tape for the fence in front of the house, but this is what it looks like. It's got a restoration in progress. So today, the Nancy Jones House does stand ready for a new beginning, and it's about 220 years after it began its life in 1803. Isn't that amazing? 220 years. Now, what the town will use it for does remain unclear, but I have learned how significant this house is to our history, to our local history, our county history, um, our community, and now you know how historically significant it is as well. And so what we really hope as friends of the Page Walker is that a fitting use will be decided upon for the house in the very near future and that we will once again see a shiny white house on the old stage road from Raleigh to Hillsboro. That's my presentation. I do not know that any archaeological field work was done on on it. That's a good question. It would be if you know, dreaming, dreaming just me, not as a friend or anything, but just me. It would be great to have some archaeological survey done with ground penetrating radar to see, if, you know, just where everything was. But not to my knowledge. Good question though. Did you have one more? What was uh, Henry's first one? Is she in Gilchrist? That? Who knows? She might have been in that in in the graveyard there. I have no idea. It's not noted, and I tried to research as best I could on her, but because it's so early, sure. that there's really that's about the only record we have about poor Sally. Yeah. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. First question, and you may have covered it. Why wasn't it called the Henry Jones House and not the Nancy House? Well, he died in 1841, and she lived till 1876, so I think most people just really uh, identify with her rather than him. And most of the, the anecdotes and everything <laughs> pertain to when she was kind of queen of the house. So, so maybe that's why. But anyway, it was their house together. What's your other question? My second question was when they moved the house from the original land 500 feet or so up. Was that land that Carrie already owned? And if so, did they, or did they, did Carrie have to purchase that land? And if so, about what did it cost then to buy the land? Do you have any idea? I, I was not involved with that. Okay. So, sorry. I, you know, I don't know all the ins and outs of that purchase. It could be somewhere in town records or somebody at the town could, no, could right. answer that. I don't see a representative from the town here today. About 2019? 
And there, I'm not representing the town or anything, but I do remember that that land, it was that whole property was part of the rezoning for the apartment complex. So they might have done it at some point. I'm not sure the details. I know it was around that time. Okay, interesting. Yeah, that, boy, the, don't those apartments sort of dwarf the house? I mean, it, it kind of, in a way, it takes away the stately nature and, and how grand that house really was. You know, because they're so big, you, you kind of lose the context of this huge house. It's kind of like if you think about the Page Walker Hotel, and there was nothing, you know, there was hardly anything in the area, and then people riding on the train, coming around, seeing these little one-story farmhouses, and all of a sudden this grand brick hotel, you know, is arising. It, it would have been a similar thing on, on a coach trip. Yeah. Other questions? Carla, I just want to mention, I'm not speaking officially for the town either, but I kind of recall hearing that there was some kind of negotiation and agreement between the town and the apartment complex owners to give up the, a western strip of the apartment complex property for this historic house to be moved there. I, I seem to recall that the town approached the owner of, the, of that land and explained to them the situation and they were good enough to agree to give up a piece of their property. I don't know whether it was sold or whether they gave it in kind. I don't know, but I, I heard that somewhere along the line. Thank you. Yeah. The, and the temple, I think, was very good about working with the town to make sure that the house was saved and moved. Yeah, yeah, Charlene. Um, were there any examples or um, samples within the home over the past 200 years that the restorers um, have been able to identify which would show the interior colors or possibly wallpaper? I know in the colonial well, um, 1800s, wallpaper became very popular. So I was just wondering mm -hmm. if Nancy Jones may have done something with the decor, if there's anything authentic somewhere in there that they can use to replicate? I, that's a good question. I don't know. I think that you know when the restoration takes place, hopefully they'll they'll peel back layers and, and find that just like they did on that piece of furniture and find you know the different layers of paint. Anything else? Yes. Can you just re-explain again with the Nathaniel Jones of White Plains versus Crabtree? Okay. <coughs> Wasn't Nancy Jones's father of Nathaniel Jones? Yes, let me go back to that slide. <laughs> yeah, because that's that is so doggone confusing. Here it is. So Francis Jones had a son named Nathaniel Jones Sr. And then he had a son, Nathaniel Jones Jr. and Henry Jones. He had other sons, but these are the only two that we were interested in today. And then Henry Jones married Nancy Jones, whose father was Nathaniel Jones of White Plains. They are not related. The White Plains Joneses, uh, Nathaniel Jones's father was Evan Jones, and he was from Eastern North Carolina. And Francis Jones was a different line. There's also a Nathaniel Jones of Middle Creek, who was around at about the same time, so it really gets very confusing, except I think they recognized very early on in legal documents that they needed to distinguish between all these Nathaniel Joneses. So in court documents, in origi the original court documents that I've looked at, you can see like in tax lists and everything, you can see it'll say Nathaniel or N-A-T-H Jones W-P, Nathaniel Jones C-T, Nathaniel Jones M-C for Middle Creek, Nathaniel Jones Senior. So they, I think they tried as best they could to, to keep it straight between them. There's anecdotes about how they ran, you know, some ran against each other in elections. <laughs> it, just, it just goes on and on. I had to cut out a whole bunch for the presentation, but um, the Jones family is very interesting. Um, you know, there were other, you know, Tignall Jones, Albridgeton Jones, Matthew Jones, there's um, Ethelred Jones, you know, the, and Interestingly enough, I'm, I'm a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution, and so we honor our patriot ancestors. And so Nathaniel Jones Sr. is a proven DAR patriot, along with Nathaniel Jones of White Plains. 
and Ethel Dred Jones is a proven patriot. So um, no, Francis Jones died before the American Revolution, so he's not included on the list. Um, and Henry Jones of Crabtree was a little bit too young to serve in the Revolution. So um, you know, it's it's interesting how you know there's such deep roots uh, in history for all of them. One last question: Is there any? Descendants still living in Cary, the Jones family. There are a lot of jo there are Joneses still around. All mm -hmm. associated with this family. Um, I know that there are Joneses. I'm not sure how how they hook up, but they you know they descend from one or both. Now see Nathaniel Henry Jones and Nancy Jones's children have the the dual Joneses in them. So. Okay. <laughs> So it, it's double interesting. Punch. Yeah, they're double clutching on them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I have that multiple times in my family, so I know. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. On the railway right now, uh, there were outbuildings indicated. Is that as much as is known about what outbuildings were part of the complex? Um, <clears throat> as far as I know, that is the only. That's the only kind of map that we have. There, there was a map that was drawn up when Henry died, and they were dividing his estate, and so it shows how the how the land was at, you know divided among the heirs. But it doesn't go into the detail that this one does. It shows you know that Nancy Jones got the home place, which is what you, widows usually got or the relic usually got but it doesn't go into all the details. So this is, this is kind of it, but we're fortunate to, to have that. And it shows, it, it went through Cary, so all along the railroad, it shows who owned the land and where their buildings were. So some of my ancestors, I could see where, you know, where the buildings and the homes were. It's interesting. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, no. Okay, two quick questions. One, uh, and Chris may know the answer to this, right now the town of Cary has, what, about a million or two million dollars into the purchase, moving, and renovations property. Do you know a number for that? Um, I think it's, you know, it's all public record. You can go and see online the, the budgets. Um, I know that there's money allocated for the restoration work that's going to be done okay. on this and for I.B. Ellington um, in the FY24 budget. Okay. Um, so that would start up in July. Okay. Um, based on what, you know, like any other citizen, you know, I've read through the, that budget. I'm not directly involved with that project anymore. So. Okay. Well, so the good news is it's not going to be abandoned. It's, it, eventually, oh, eventually it's going to happen. Uh, the, se the second question I have is, I remember seeing a picture from someone who went in and evaluated the building before the town purchased it, got the historic designation, made the move, and it was in the crawl space and there were eggs. Did they ever figure out, do you, are you familiar with that, did they ever figure out what the eggs were from? <laughs> I do know that because I, I could have been, I uh, could have been busted. I don't know. Uh, I do know that there were problems with water in that base when the cellar, and that they had to keep a sump pump run, running for a while uh, in order to make sure that the house was not deteriorated from within, um, and uh, that there were critters from time to time that uh, took um, refuge in the basement. It was, Fairly, the cellar was, you could stand up in okay. portions of the cellar, uh, but um, no, I, 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 I haven't heard anything about the eggs, but I will tell you a story about the bees. Um, twice we had to have bees removed. Now we did this using uh, a specialist who saved the bees and took them elsewhere, but they had made a nest in the wall in the parlor on the west side, front parlor, and it, we couldn't have them stay. Um, and uh, but yes, I visited the house when there was indeed bees in the wall, and and uh, we had to have them come actually twice to remove them because apparently we didn't seal it up enough after the first time. Is that it had some of the strange sounds. 
There you go. I think well, this was much later. This has been, this has been with, since, uh, yeah, it could be uh, since probably 2010. Well, since the team, uh, since the town purchased it, or, 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 or was in the process of purchasing it. Yes. What's the projected date of completion for the restoration? You know, I wish I had more details for you. I, I did try to come prepared with that information, but wasn't able to get it before my presentation. So, so I don't about it continuing to degrade. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that, um, you yeah, know, but maybe trying to get information directly from the town, the historic preservation specialist, you can go on and, and find information and contact leads and so forth. Uh, on the Town of Cary website to ask those questions. Um, we have a couple of opportunities where you can sign up to be a member of the Friends today or to be, um, you know, to volunteer with us. There's some opportunities, so there are little QR codes that you can scan with your phone or pick up one of the cards and just take a look at our website. Um, we have a Facebook page that we try and keep updated and an Instagram account. Uh, so you can follow us in any of those ways to kind of keep up on what we find out. I mean, sometimes we don't find out until the last minute, but we try, when we get information, we try to put it right out there so the public will be informed as well. Other questions? Y'all are a great audience. Thank you so very much for coming out and spending your afternoon with us today.